praise you. You are worthy of so much more than we can give, but please accept our the sacrifice of our lips and our lives. Thank you for this group. Thank you for the uh, spiritual benefits we derive from being a part of this group. Thank you for the encouragement and the admonishment we receive from each other. Thank you that we can study together, to grow together in unity, and to be better equipped to serve you. Please help us in our struggle to be more like Jesus was. Thank you for his example. Again, please help us. We need your help. Thank you for salvation and for forgiveness, mercy, and grace, and patience. We pray that we will, as it were, need this less and less as we grow older in serving you. But we'll always need your grace, and we're grateful for it. Help us together as we study together this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. John 3. <clears throat> John 2, having asserted his authority over the natural and the spiritual. That's what John or Jesus does. He turns water into wine, saying, I have authority over the natural. And then he cleanses the temple and asserts his authority over the spiritual. Having done that, verse 23, many believe on him. When he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name, observing his signs which he was doing. And you remember that that's part of why Jesus, or actually why John wrote John, is so that he could record some of the signs so that we could have faith. And we see it here working. But Jesus does not believe them. It's the same word in the original. They believe him. But Jesus, on his part, was not entrusting himself to them. For he knew all men, and because he did not need anyone to testify concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man. And we understand that there is some degree of their faith just being under-informed. Nicodemus will come and say, you're from God as a teacher. Yes, absolutely true, but so much more than a teacher. Uh, Nathaniel will say, you're the son of God, you're the king of Israel. Yes, but so much more than you could possibly imagine. Also, there is this aspect, this nuance of, yeah, they believe in him, but only as much as they want to, right? Later on, they'll just leave him in droves, and he understands. Yes, well, we believe in you, uh, Johnny come lately, as it were. Uh, and then he tells them more about himself and what he requires, and they say, no, thank you. That is the backdrop that is what's going on when we meet Nicodemus. He is one of those people. He's one of the Jews. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man, so verse 1 tells us who he is. Verse 2, the first part of it, he'll be the nighttime confessor. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with them. So the signs are working here on Nicodemus. But to understand the significance of him coming at nighttime, I don't want to push it too far, but I know still that in John chapter 7, verse 45, so the officers of the court had gone to get Jesus. They come back and they say, wow, this man Jesus is doing interesting things. Verse 45, the officers came to the chief priests, the Pharisees, and said to them, uh, and they said to them, why did you not bring him? The officers answered, never has a man spoken the way this man speaks. The Pharisees then answered them, you have not also been led astray, have you? Now listen, no one of the rulers or the Pharisees has believed in him, has he? Wait a minute. What is Nicodemus? A ruler and a Pharisee. Has one of the rulers of the Pharisees believed in Jesus? Yes. Well, apparently, but not so as you could tell. 
right? They don't, his comrades don't know. Verse 49, this crowd which does not know the law is accursed. Nicodemus, he who came to him before, uh, before being one of them, said to them, Our law does not judge man unless it first hears from him and knows what he is doing, does it? They answered in him and said, You are not also, and I summarize, a believer in him. They don't know about him. Okay, so he's coming at nighttime. Is he believing? He's starting to. But he is on the fence. And that's what a lot of this passage is about. A lot of this passage is about correcting his misunderstandings and also saying, Nicodemus, you've got to make a decision here. So, Nicodemus confesses. He confesses that Jesus is from God. Notice he says, we know that you have come from God. So there's a we, there's Nicodemus, and there's the we. Also, we know, that is, we believe, same thing, so these signs are working. Remember verse 23 of chapter 2, he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast. Many believed in his name, observing the signs. They know Jesus is from God, and Jesus is a teacher. And Jesus will now take over and control this conversation. He will start by assuming the role that Nicodemus had attributed to him. You're a teacher. Yes. <laughs> Assuming that I am a teacher, I don't know what you came here to ask me. I'm sure Jesus had an inkling. But I'm going to take over this conversation. Jesus answered and said to him, now Jesus is going to say a lot in the next few verses. I'm going to summarize it first here. He teaches about he being from God. Nicodemus says, we know you're from God. You're a teacher from God. And Jesus is going to say, yes, I'm a teacher. I'm a whole lot more. Look in verse, for example, verse 17. God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. So I am a teacher, but I'm a whole lot more than a teacher. In verse 15, uh, verse 14, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that whoever believes in him will in him have eternal life. I am a teacher, but I am so much more than a teacher. And also, Jesus will address this Nicodemus and we. Jesus comes, excuse me, Nicodemus comes and says, we know that you have come from God. Now that's easy, easy to see in English. Some of it is not. We know that you have come from God. Then Jesus starts this intercourse, this discourse. Do not be amazed that I said to you, singular, y'all must be born again. If I told y'all earthly things, y'all do not believe, how will y'all believe if I tell y'all heavenly things? Okay, so Nicodemus comes in and he represents some people and himself. And Jesus starts talking to him, but is also addressing everybody else that thinks like he does. And now, of course, we remember he is a ruler and a Pharisee. Okay, he will essentially address two things. One of them we remember. Who does a good Jew think is going to be saved? There's who and there's how. Who does a good Jew think is going to inherit the kingdom? The Jew. Yeah, the Jew. The good a Jew. Jew. And what's going to happen to the Gentiles? They're the outer whatever. <laughs> right. Remember verse 17. God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world. That's what he thinks. The world's going to be judged. In this, Jesus is going to be correcting him, saying, no, I, 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 I judge anybody who doesn't believe. Now, the who is the Jew is going to walk into the kingdom. Well, Nicodemus is a, he's a Jew of Jews. He thinks he's going to walk into the kingdom. And there's the who and how do they walk into the kingdom. They're born a Jew. They're born a Jew. And they keep the law of Moses. Right? Jesus is going to say, for example, in verse 16, For God so loved the world, not just the Jews, God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son that 
whoever, not just Jews, believes, not just keeps the law of Moses. So all throughout this little text here, Jesus is going to be countering those things. Salvation depends on belief, not ethnicity. Salvation is for anyone, not Jews only. A good Jew believes that good will, a good Jew will inherit the kingdom, and a good Jew believes that no Gentile will inherit the kingdom unless the Gentile becomes a Jew, right? That's, that's what they believe. Now, look at this state. This is, the, this is the key for figuring out this passage. Nicodemus, don't you be surprised that I said to y'all that you must be born again. That's what this whole thing is about. Nicodemus comes, he's in. And Jesus says, no, you're not. You're, you're born a Jew. Right. You, that, that's, that's not that important. Right, right, that's, that's right. It's, it has its advantages, Romans 3, but the advantages only go so far. The law will never save anybody. Do not be surprised that I said that all of y'all must be born again. What? So Nicodemus is saying, what? We all have to be born again? Down here, this is countering only Jews. No, God so loved the world. God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world, even not Jews, could be saved through him. There's the who. There's more of the who. Whoever believes in him. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him. Uh, God did not send in, yep, 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 verse 18, he who believes in him, he who does not believe, that includes the Jews both ways, right? This cuts both ways. He who practices the truth, anybody, it doesn't matter, all the Jews who practice, that's not what he said. His pronouns are saying salvation is for a lot more than the Jews. He actually started it unless one is born again, anybody, he so there's the who, there's the how. I have a question, just really quick to, yep. to confirm. You're saying when he's using singular pronouns for us, they actually are plural? Us? Not for us. I'm, I mean for us. Uh, oh, boy. <laughs> Talking about language can be hard for me. Um, uh, um, I say to you, unless one. That you there is actually a you all? No. When he says, I say to you, that's singular. When he said, when, when, what word are you substituting with y'all? The one it's over. Oh, I know. All the one, okay. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah, uh -huh. Because when, I thought it was the one that was behind. <laughs> and so I was right. starting to get confused. Oh, um, <laughs> truly, truly, I say, oh, wait, wait, wait. Where are we? Verse. You, had, you had lots of them a minute ago, and then they went away. I told y'all earthly things, and y'all okay. do not believe. How will y'all believe if I tell y'all heavenly things? And so what is the difference between that and the you in verse? A minute ago, you just found a singular one. Oh, oh in, in verse 5, truly I say to you. I'm sorry. Okay, so verse 7, we have a... A you, singular, followed immediately by a y'all. Exactly. Yeah. That, what, that is what's going on there. Yes. Okay. And, and you know that because they're two different words? Or, or they, they're, they're obviously different? They're, or is it totally context? No, no. no okay. context. It's okay. like if you read y'all, mm -hmm. okay. you know. You, you would, if you read you, singular, no, we lose and it. you, plural... We, by the time it gets to us in English, we yeah, lose that. We lose it. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. That's okay. Oh dear, I'm going the wrong way. Wrong way, wrong way, wrong way, wrong way. Uh-huh, 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 uh-huh. this. Okay, I think we're... Right. So now he's talking about the role of the Son of the Son of Man. You've got to believe. Whoever believes in him will have eternal life. So this is all about who and how. That's what this whole thing's about. We already know all of that. John already wrote about all this in chapter 1. Chapter 1, verse 9. There was the true light which coming into the world enlightens every man. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. Verse 11. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. Nicodemus, what are you going to do? But as many as received him, 
To them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. It doesn't matter who it is, Jew or not, whoever believes in his name, whoever believes, who and how, uh, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. This is exactly what he will go on to say in this chapter. Shall we read the chapter now? <laughs> there was a man, a Pharisee of the Pharisees, named Nicodemus, the ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And Jesus, the, the dialogue is interesting to see him use the same words back to Nicodemus. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. It's, it's, it's interesting. Nobody can do this unless they're from God. Nicodemus is stressing, unless they're from God. And Jesus turns around and stresses right back to him. Okay, I'm going to set that aside, and I'm going to stress to you that nobody can get the kingdom of heaven, I'm going to use your word, unless they're born again. Nicodemus, in verse 4, said to him, How can a man be born again when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? If nothing else, Nicodemus is confused, apparently. I hope he's not being um, snarky. I don't think he is. But he's at least confused, and he at least gets everything I've been thinking about how it gets into the in, how it, the entrance into the kingdom has been wrong. I have been mistaken. He's going to learn more about it, but at least that is shaken, that, that idea. Verse 5, Jesus answered and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter in the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of Spirit is Spirit. Nicodemus thinks that which is born of flesh is Spirit. I'm going to walk into the kingdom because of my fleshly ancestry. But we're comparing, we have a class problem here. You're, you're applying to one class what should not be applied to that class, right? How do you know if somebody has the flu? If they're from Austria, they have the flu, right? And if they're from England, they have the cold, right? No. <laughs> no. How do you know somebody has the flu or the cold? If they have the flu, their temperature goes up. If they have the cold, they cough. You can't tell by looking at the person, their ethnicity, what their problem is. Or in this case, what the good of them, the spiritual blessing they have. Do not be amazed. Oh, verse 6, that which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said this to you. Y'all must be born again, all of you. What? The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from or where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. You can't look at them and say, oh, their ethnicity determines whether they're born of the Spirit. This is a variation of you will know them by their fruits. Will you be able to look at them and tell? To the degree that we are able to observe their fruits is the degree that we have a pretty good guess, but still we could even be wrong. But it's not by looking at them and saying, oh, you're a Jew. Verse 9, Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? I mean, he's, his world has been rattled. Jesus will chastise him here. Are you, emphasis, are you, double emphasis, the teacher? Oh, you're the, you're the big guy? And you don't get this? Are you the teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you that we speak of what we know and testify of what we have seen, and you do not accept our testimony. He's including Nicodemus in there. you got to be careful, Nicodemus. You're of the crowd that has not accepted the baptism of John, for example. I don't know if Nicodemus had or had not, but most of his crowd had not. Verse 12, if I told y'all earthly things and y'all do not believe, how will y'all believe if I tell you heavenly things? There has to be some repentance. This Nicodemus, 
if we got to go forward, you're on the right track and this is great, but you need to keep on this track, this track of repentance. No one has ascended into heaven, but he who ascended from heaven, the Son of Man. I am qualified to teach, is what Jesus is saying here. As Moses lifted up uh, the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man will be lifted up. Now he's getting back into the plan of salvation. Okay, He's done chastising Nicodemus, letting Nicodemus know there needs to be some repentance, letting Nicodemus know that Jesus is qualified to talk about these things. Now he's talking about these things. Verse 15, so whoever believes in uh, will in him have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him shall have not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world but that the world might be saved through him. He who <coughs> believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment that the light came into the world and the men loved the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. Which is another way of saying what he already said in verse 8. The wind blows where it wishes and you will hear the sound of it. We do not where it come, know where it comes from or where it's going. So is everyone who's born of the Spirit. And in all of this Jesus is saying to the one who came by night and the one who several chapters later, they still don't know what he thinks. He's saying to him, everything I'm saying applies to you. Y'all need to repent, including you, Nicodemus. And the question is, are you going to accept this light or reject it? Now we know what Nicodemus does. In chapter 19, I think it's 19, Verse 39, John 19, 39, Nicodemus, who had first come to him by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes and a hundred pounds weight. And they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen wrappings with the spices, as is the burial custom. In other words, he, he comes out here and declares, if he hadn't already, everybody now knows that Nicodemus is somebody who believes in Jesus. I have three points. Anybody else? Comment or question? So much to be unlearned. Yes. Before understanding. Yep. Applies to me too. So, along those lines, some, I will say too many religious teachers don't have a clue. <laughs> And in fact, I need to look in the mirror and need to be very, very humble and say, hey, where am I in this spectrum on any given topic or any given doctrine or whatever it is? And, and, and expect it, you know, hey, and Nicodemus was a good guy, but was mistaken. I'd like to think I'm a good guy. I happen to know I'm mistaken, <laughs> right? So let's all have patience with each other. At the same time, I read yesterday, be careful who you trust. Salt and sugar look the same. You don't, you don't want to confuse those two. Salt and sugar look the same. Martin Luther, when Copernicus was discovering what he discovered, that the earth goes around the sun and not the sun going around the earth, Martin Luther, now I don't agree with him doctrinally, that doesn't mean that I don't think he's smart. I think he's, a, in fact, the world would say he's a very smart man. He said about Copernicus, whoever wishes to appear, appear clever must devise some new system, which of all systems is, of course, the very best. This fool wishes to reverse the entire science of astronomy. But sacred scripture tells us that Joshua commanded the sun to stand still and not the earth. <laughs> some very smart people can be very, very wrong about some very important things. The question is, when they receive the truth, what are they going to do? That's the question. Nicodemus needed some chastising. Verses 9 through 13, 9, 10, 11, and 12 especially, they're, they're mild, 
but it's Nicodemus. You need to change. Nicodemus, Nicodemus, the Pharisee and the ruler of the Jews, is not used to hearing that, right? But yet that's the very thing he needed, and apparently he accepted it the right way. Nicodemus came. We saw, we say, vini, vidi, vici, vine, vidi. We came, I came, I saw, I conquered, right? Well, Nicodemus came, he heard, and he converted or he repented. And notice, all the other Jews, after Nicodemus had converted, all the other leaders and Pharisees, could they have learned and converted like Nicodemus? Why didn't they? They didn't want to. That's what he says, right? Everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. That's it. But they look good. They look good. They look really honored. Religious? Yes. Nice people? Yes. Except the doctrine as it's exposed to them? No. You could say of them that they believe the lie. Oh, yeah. And we have to be careful of that, too. There are many, many in the political Christianhood who tell lies about this passage. Yep. And you can believe the lie. Because some really smart people believe that. Yep. Yep. Smart people end up being deceived. You need to love God and put a little faith in Him. Say, Lord, help me get out of, help me not become, remain in deception. If, if I'm starting to head that way, accidentally, help me to steer out of it. Indecisiveness kills. Nicodemus, what are you going to do? You've got to do something. I read recently, fatal indecision of mind is a greater disqualification than stupidity or even want of personal courage. He doesn't have courage. Is that a problem? Yes. <laughs> to use the word, he's stupid. Is that a problem? Yes. But greater than those problems is somebody who will not decide either way. Somebody who will not quit. I've seen statues of many great men riding horses, but none riding fences. Right? Nicodemus, you need to make a decision. John referred to, uh, Gary referred to passages or people who abuse this text. We're not going to go through all this because I'm going to spare you unless you want to. This and I'll allow water. you to raise your hand. What? This is about water. It boils water. Because, because, because the argument being made, well, water referring to the first birth and the spirit. Yeah. Because uh, if that's what this is about, please take your time. Okay. <laughs> uh, you know, a little bit. Okay. So let's get all the way. Let's not look at all these. Romans 6 does not use the word born again, but we are made alive. Right. Does that sound like being born again? Dead. Right. Alive again. You, you cannot miss it. Any, anybody who misses that wants to miss it. Right. And, and, and then how did this happen? Just, At, because, just because you sat there and believed? Right. No. You said a prayer. <laughs> you, you cannot miss this. Everybody here knows this. But they overlook it. Okay, right. Marcel Network. I listen to him. Yeah. I'm telling you, I listen to a guy in his exposition in Romans chapter 6. First seven verses, he never touched him. Right. Right. Nice. It's nice work if you can get it. No, it's not nice work. <laughs> Colossians 2, the circumcision. It doesn't use the word born again. But at your baptism, you were dead in your trespasses, he made you alive. Same idea. Christ begins to own us at baptism. 1 Corinthians 1.13, Galatians 3.26-29. God adopts us as his special children. We're all his children, but his special children at baptism. The fruit of the Spirit is enabled at baptism. Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 26. The end of it talks about having, let's just read that real quick, that one little verse there. Galatians chapter 5, verse 20. Uh, verse 
verse 24. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. That's Colossians 2, that's Romans 6. It just, you can't miss it when you read them. <clears throat> uh, justification and sanctification occur at baptism. First Peter chapter 3. This passage and this passage use the term born again. Okay? They use it. It's right there. Let's go and read 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. I'm going to read verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied to you. Wait, I'm in the wrong. Uh, the word chosen in verse 1, in my version, may not be in verse 1, in your version. Right. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. <laughs> They're chosen according to the foreknowledge of God by the sanctifying work of the Spirit to obey Jesus Christ to be sprinkled with his blood. Verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an obtain to obtain an inheritance, so on and so forth. Look at verse 22. Since you have, how, what did this, it says the Spirit, which John 3 talks about. It says, talk, you're born again. Okay, when does that happen? Verse 22. Since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls, for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another, for you have been born again, not of a seed which is perishable, but skip down to verse 25, but the word of the Lord endures forever, and this is the word which was preached to you. They hear the word which is sent by the Spirit, that's verse 12, it was revealed to them that they are not serving themselves, but you... In these things which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. So I'm not doing I'm not even trying to really do a good job of this because you all know this, right? You understand that. The Spirit sends the word. The people obey the word, they get into the water, they come up out of it, and they are born again. <clears throat> The Spirit's role brings the Word. Titus 3 talks about regeneration. Ephesians 5, 26 talks about the washing of regeneration with the Word. Hebrews chapter 10 tells us that we have had our bodies washed with pure water. That word washed there is translated washings in chapter 9, verse 10 but it's referring to the baptisms of the Old Testament. Now, there's a lot of stuff there. The spiritual washing of... This is John MacArthur, Calvinist. Baptism is not necessary. You're bad if you say it is. The spiritual washing of, purific of purification of the soul is accomplished by the Holy Spirit through the Word at the moment of salvation. Which is what I just said if you were paying close attention <laughs> Right? The Word sends the Spirit. Excuse me. The Spirit sends the Word. That's what I'm saying. The Spirit sends the Word. The person receives the Word. He's baptized. It is accomplished by the Holy Spirit through the Word. This is what we're saying here in John chapter 3. Right? In John chapter 3, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. I know at least that the Spirit also refers to, if it might refer to more, but at least refers to the Spirit sends the Word. People obey the Word, and they're washed in water. You're born of Spirit and the Word. Right, but then to, to play on John MacArthur, because I've heard this, yeah. I've heard this, he goes to verse 8. Yeah. He goes to verse 8 to back itself up here. To change. Yeah, or however you want to state that. Right. He uses, he goes to verse 8, he says, look, the wind blows where it wishes, you hear the sound, you don't... So is the Spirit. The Spirit yeah. just moves and just saves you and saves you right. when you do this. I, I don't but know. this part he gets. This part is right. This part is right. It is accomplished by the Holy Spirit through the Word of God. This part he gets. So that's my only point right now is here's a Calvinist 
And you can do this all day long. By the way, I could find anything I wanted to prove in commentaries. Yeah, that's right. Right? So what is actually the question? Should I be looking for the commentary that supports my view? Does the, does the word of God harmonize? Right. Sweeping baptism under, under the rug. That you guys seen this recently. The doctrine of absolute necessity of baptism for salvation has always been based on two declarations of our Lord, Mark 16, 16, John 3, 5. The necessity of baptism has been inferred from John 3, 5. The most important thing, the, the most that can be inferred from the two passages is the ordinary necessity of baptism. Yes, now, what's he going to do with it? He just makes it go away. Where it can be had. Listen, we are bound to God's instructions, but God's spirit is free, what you just said, and bloweth where it listeth. I love that. And then, the necessity of baptism for salvation has been inferred, but while we are bound to God's ordinances, God himself is free and can save whomever, whomsoever, by whatsoever means he pleases. I, yeah, do we see baptism? Yes. And then we just sweep it under the rug. Okay? By the way, he is here. I want to make a point. Keep this in mind. He is getting into God's head here. God has said this, but God's going to do, I know what God's going to do. God has said this, but we read over here that God does some other things, and so I know what God's going to do. Keep that in mind. The ESV study Bible. The phrase born of water and the spirit refers to spiritual birth with cleanses from sin and spiritual transformation and renewal. Water here does not refer to the water of physical birth. There you go, George, there's my answer. Nor is it likely that it refers to baptism. Okay? Why not? For further discussion on being born again, see 1 John 2, 3 John 9, uh, 1 John 2, 1 John 3, 9, 1 John 4, 7, 1 John 5, 1, 4, 8, and 4, 18, whatever that is. Now, those say born of God. They, they say born of God, born of God, born of God. But what didn't he include? For further discussion on born again, where would you go? Well, let's, let's do this. Let's, with our big fancy computer program, we'll put in born again in quotes. And you won't end up there. Now, here's the thing. Did he have the information on that other chart? He does. He sweeps it under the rug. Two things they have done. The false argument has been, number one, to think you know what God's going to think. And number two, if you have evidence, don't provide it for the people to see. Does that sound like you've heard that this week? Yeah, yeah that's true. It's exactly if I understand everything rightly, which I'm sure I'm missing something, but that is the procedure of the arguments that are coming out of Capitol Hill right now. They are exactly the same. And my point is this. Falsehood manifests itself the same ways over and over and over. Satan has a certain set of patterns. He, didn't use, he doesn't use one thing in politics if he's, I don't know, I don't want to say he's behind all that, I don't know. But it's not like, oh, when we deceive in politics, we use something else than when we deceive in theology, and then we use some other forms when we deceive in secular or whatever that might be. No, they're the, all the same things, and so you need to look for them, and you'll see them pop up again and again and again. George wanted to talk about the water of physical birth. What um, the, the only thing I'll say, I'll say two things. Most people, most commentaries, if you read the com the most people who say that don't agree with most commentaries. It's the water of birth, right? That's what you're getting, the water of birth. Most commentaries don't say that. I mean, you open up 100 com yeah, you'll find some that do, but if you open up 100 different random commentaries, most of them will not say that. Because right, it doesn't make sense. Because it doesn't make sense, and Nicodemus knew that. That's right. Right. Now, having said that, how do they get there? by overlooking the chart, the, the, that slew of passages. That's the only answer I have. And it, you know, it, it'll take time. Let's look at this, look at this, look at this. It'll take time to show them. It'll take time for them to understand it. It'll then take time for them to accept it. 
you know, and so we're taking our time when we're doing those things. By the way, on 1 John 5, 1, everyone who believes has been born of God. Regeneration precedes faith. If that is true, then we can all go do what we want. That assumes total hereditary depravity. You can't even want to do what's right. In order to want to do what's right, God first has to make you alive. And then you'll believe. But you can't believe before you're alive, and God does that directly. So, let's go home. Christians today were dead. Since Christians today were dead, oh, today, I don't even know where I'm getting at. Since Christians were dead, they first had to be made alive <coughs> before they could believe. Yeah? I have a question. Is this, are we talking, is this the same person talking here as who was talking in your previous slides? No. I was, I was just thinking about the fact. But he'll say the same thing. Okay, okay. Everyone who believes in the Lord of God, so regeneration precedes faith. How can you how can you prove that? The Lord's Spirit bloweth where it lifts it. Right. That's his proof. But but I mean if, if that's if that's the I mean if you can use bloweth where it listeth right. to argue away one thing that God requires of us, you can use it to argue away anything. So who is gonna fall for it? Somebody who doesn't want to know the truth. Right. Somebody yeah. who will accept that. Right. So that's who this Generally, yeah, I know it gets complicated. And some things you're like, Wah. but generally speaking, those are the types of arguments over and over and over, right? In, in a sense, you're telling people what they want to hear, right? I mean, for, by large, yeah. no, I don't think I want to hear that I can't be saved unless God picked me especially. Well, and that's one of the things. Unless you're one of the ones that are going to pick especially, they're not going to say that, right? And that's it. No, oh, I've been picked especially, and of course we've been through this before. You push them, and you push them, and you push them. Do you really know it? No, you, you do not, because you can always lose your salvation. You can always have appeared to have been saved, but not actually have been saved. And you won't know until judgment. <clears throat> uh, first had to be made alive before they could believe. Right. Um, this is why salvation is by grace alone. All this assumes God works directly in them to change them. Right? God works. God can work directly. But all we can show is that God uses the word. Remember, the Spirit sends the word, they believe the word, and then they are baptized. They have faith, yet they, they are baptized, and then they're at that point they're regenerated. So just sweep it under the rug. You know, it's not that it's not there. It's that how do we how do we win our arguments? Well, we we first try to think what God's thinking. Secondly, we just sweep the evidence on the rug, and then we come, oh, oh, but they found that evidence, and then they'll turn to John 3, 8, and say, oh, well, it's this way. You know, they make false arguments. We need to be careful. No, let's not look at that. Let's not look at that. Okay. Yeah? One, one thing to keep in mind here, yes, Nicodemus, this, this blew him out of the water. But blew him into it. Okay, blew him into it, however you want to look at it. But it took him time. Yeah. It took him time. God was patient. Yeah. God's patient with us. We got to be patient right. with others. Because when you tell people that, you know, have believed all their life that all they have to do is sit in the chair and say, yeah, I believe in Jesus, I'm saved. You tell them that that's not really what the Bible says. Yeah. That's, I think you're nuts. Uh, <laughs> watching this uh, transformation of Miss uh, Stephanie down in Belize has been fascinating to watch because she grew up steeped in Calvinism and Mennonitism. I mean, that's, that's what she lived. And she went to the college, and she did the thing, and she she's all about it. And then for five years, mom and dad studied, mom and dad studied, mom and dad, and something's eaten away, something's eaten away for five years. And then she finally sees, yep, baptism is right. And so she gets that. And then she starts to see that all these traditions, all these traditions are unbiblical, they set you up for a false sense of security. She starts seeing all of them, and she's becoming angry. She's angry, which she ought to be. Look, that, that is something to be angry at. That's false teaching. Um, but it took her five years just to begin. Get in the water. Yeah, right. Uh, I've told you this before. I go out to a place called uh, whatever, St. Louis, Missouri. Misery, I call it. And... Um, there's a man there who, every time I preach there, he comes up to me and says, it took me 10 years 
10 years of my neighbor to be studying with me. You know, thank God for God's patience. May God be patient with me. Let's stop. We got going late. Let's stop early. <laughs> uh, although the next text isn't uh, won't take us long to cover. Any other, anything else from Nicodemus? Fascinating account. Okay, let's break till right on the hour. Thanks for your work today.